On this edition of VLGA Connect, we're very pleased to have with us the Federal Minister for Local Government, also Federal Minister for Regional Health and Regional Communications, Mark Colton. Hello and welcome. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Greetings from Northern New South Wales. Indeed, nice, nice to have you with us. Uh, I've been looking forward to chatting with you, not just about current circumstances and how they're impacting on local government, but you have a strong affection for local government yourself being a former mayor, I understand. Yes, it's a, it's a little bit in, it's a bit of a family thing as well. My father was on the local council, I think, for thirty years, and uh, was 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 the shire president, and then uh, changed to mayor uh, over a period of you know changes to local government uh, uh, constitutions and whatnot. And uh, uh, when I went to uh, uh, to federal parliament, my brother is uh, now the mayor. Uh, he's right. been there now for about 10, 10 or eleven years. So. Uh, I guess uh, community involvement sort of does run in the family and our family's been one that's sort of been involved in local uh, activities from not only sort of the council, but uh, the local show society and uh, school PNCs and service clubs and things like that. Uh, that. That's just the nature of living in a small country town. So Minister, what municipality is that that you were mayor of and where your brothers met? Okay, so it'll be interesting for some of your people because it was a, in 2004, uh, the then New South Wales government uh, went through a period of amalgamations and they amalgamated uh, basically two and a half councils in northern New South Wales. Uh, they were Yallaroy, Bingra and Baraba and uh, uh, formed Gwydershire. So I, uh, 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 usual motivation for getting involved in local government, I didn't like the process and uh, the new amalgamated headquarters was going to be 100 kilometres from where I lived and I thought that was going to be bad. So I put my hand up and uh, long story short, I got elected as mayor at my very first council meeting. Uh, on the council, I had three or four ex-mayors and an ex-president of the New South Wales Local Government Association. So I wasn't short of advice, uh, <laughs> but I've got to say, uh, it was the thing that led me to, to wanting to, to, uh, to, be, to make it a full-time Occupations. The best job I've ever had was the mayor of a local council. Uh, we, uh, uh, I think we did. We, we won the AR Blewett Award, which is a, a prestigious award in New South Wales, in our first year. And uh, and, and I just uh, I, I, I got bitten by the bug. And then when the opportunity came to run uh, for the local federal seat, um, I threw my hat in. Um, do you often find yourself ringing up your brother and giving him advice or vice versa? <laughs> it's probably the other way around. Uh, actually, the frustration of it all is that uh, sometimes when you are uh, close to someone and you know, we're, we're going through grants processes uh, uh, in, in you know, local government and other things is that uh, when it comes to the local area, I have to preclude myself. Uh, from from that discussion, and so I can't actually go in and fight for his uh, issues particularly well because, uh, as we've all seen in recent times, there's a lot of scrutiny on how decisions are made at federal government level. But uh, now he's uh, uh, we we talk uh, you know quite a lot uh, in in my own electorate. I've got 18 council areas and uh, what's known as the unincorporated area, which is the area that's so sparsely populated in Western New South Wales it doesn't have a council. So uh, my, my electorate's half of New South Wales. I think it's two and a half times the size of Victoria. Terrific. So to, to current issues, COVID-19 and the way the sector's responding, how well equipped do you feel you are because of your local government background to understand the issues that councils are dealing with now? Uh, it's, yeah, look, I think it does help. Um, I'm also regional health and regional communication. So that's been an issue as well. And so to, quite frankly, uh, you know, on a, on a daily basis, uh, my responsibility for the uh, regional um, response from the federal government to health uh, has probably taken a lot of my time. But uh, I've just got off a, f a phone call uh, with the uh, Australian Local Government Association Executive uh, and the Deputy Prime Minister on a Zoom meeting. Uh, we just finished it before I came on to talk to you. So I do meet with them and ministers on a regular basis. But what's been a really interesting uh, is that um, you know, from a regional area, mostly uh, when we're talking about issues with local government, it's the more smaller, remote regional councils that have had an issue with a drought or a bushfire or, or whatever. Uh, what's been um, probably unexpected to me uh, was that the first councils that had the big hit and the ones that have actually had to, uh, uh, you know, concerns are the big, more 
affluent city councils uh, because a lot of their budgets, you know, the, a, a small regional council probably has 80% of its income uh, from grants, either state or federal government grants, yeah, you know, low rate base. Some of my, my smallest council is 50,000 square kilometres and it's got 2,700 rate payers. Uh, wow. And then, you know, in Queensland, there's actually, uh, you know, less than that. Uh, so uh, some of those bigger city-based councils that have a lot of income uh, that, you know, that regional ones are normally envious of with uh, uh, parking, uh, you know, permits for, you know, curbside dining, uh, uh, facilities that they rent out, you know, conference centres and things like that, that generally give them a good source of income. Uh, that's just stopped. And so they very, very quickly got into, uh, uh, into financial difficulties quicker than, uh, than, the, than the smaller regional ones because, you know, quite touch wood up until now. Uh, they've been largely untouched by the pandemic, uh, not like the cities have. So it's been it's been difficult because that's uh, we're dealing with a cohort of, of councils that normally uh, are pretty well self sufficient. So what lessons do you take from that? I guess uh, in terms of the resilience of the sector to cope with, um, you know, in this in, for some of them a string of crises that are that are obviously going to get to a point where it's going to be really difficult to to come back to to former strength. Yeah, look, in a way, the councils are bound a lot by legislation and, 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 you know, the mindset of what they do. The councils are not like a corporation where, where you know, they can uh, have uh, a work on making profits that so their ratepayers would be particularly upset if they knew that uh, uh, councils were, were making profits. They, they, they need to, they, they want to see that the services are delivered uh, by the council and uh, the funds that, that come through, through local through their own uh, you know, rate base or services that they charge for or state and federal grants. They want to see that delivered on the ground. So c councils really um, don't have that ability to be prepared for, the, you know, for a crisis uh, like this. Uh, some councils do have funds uh, that are sitting there, but legislation has them tied up in developer um, uh, contributions uh, to waste uh, the waste account, you know, where they put money away uh, on a regular basis for the upgrade of their waste facilities or their water account or, or whatever. So uh, in some ways, uh, they are sort of locked into a, a fairly direct hand-to-mouth uh, existence, and that's basically what they're designed to do. So uh, it has been particularly difficult for them. There's been a lot of contention, I've got to say, uh, because they weren't uh, available to uh, have the jobs the job keeper program, yeah. uh, but once again, uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that the, the uh, national cabinet did decide that the states would take responsibility. It wasn't just a federal decision on that, but also, job keeper was designed for businesses that actually make profit and uh, you know ha have drops in income and things like that. So the the design of job keeper wouldn't have been suitable for council. And if the federal government did put in a uh, like a, an employment uh, project uh, uh, for councils that wouldn't be JobKeeper, it would have had to have been a different one. But we are looking to councils for uh, delivering uh, stimulus uh, packages. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister has written to all the councils in Australia asking for bring forwards on infrastructure uh, so that we can stimulate uh, the local economy through council uh, in various ways. So that's, that's perhaps uh, going towards a question I was going to ask you about how federally the sector can be supported. So, um, you know, bringing forward those stimulus projects is, is one. The federal assistance grants, what's the latest with those? Because traditionally, I think for the past few years, at least money's come forward sooner than councils were mm. expecting. Is that likely to continue? Yeah, look, I, uh, to be honest, I think it will. It's under sort of the final stages of the discussion now uh, by the... Uh, expenditure review committee of government but um, the reality is now um, eight of the last 10 years has been a bring forward on federal assistance grants and so not to do it this year basically would be a change rather than the, you know it's almost become the norm uh, not that I'm comfortable with that position I, I actually think that uh, uh, we need to get back on track I, I, I know uh, uh, that the, the bring forward is not sometimes it's portrayed by some in government, that this is uh, so, so some sort of a bonus for councils. It's, it's actually not. No, it's, uh, not. it's not extra money. It's not extra money. It's, uh, it does help with cash flow. But uh, so, uh, look, I would think that we will see that 
this year, obviously with the COVID-19, a lot of those other reforms that uh, I would like to have uh, be working on is probably going to get to, to, uh, uh, to push down the track a little bit because we're basically dealing with the more immediate crisis that we're fighting at the moment. It, it, you're right, it's, it's, it's not a bonus. It's really just in the way it's treated in an accounting sense in, in many cases. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, you mentioned JobKeeper. What are your observations about how the different states have responded and how the sector across the country more broadly. Are you seeing any differences in the sector's um, uh, responses and its ability to rebound? Yeah, I have. Uh, uh, I ha I've just, in the previous conference, the, the representative from Victoria was uh, uh, talking about, um, you know, there, there wasn't a huge uh, amount of support coming through to the sector. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to point the finger at states. It's a dangerous position when you're a federal poly, but. Uh, I know New South Wales uh, has done, uh, stepped up uh, with uh, supporting uh, childcare centres that are owned by local government. Uh, they have put some uh, stimulus in uh, with, uh, with through local councils. And also uh, some of the state bodies of the, uh, the services union have actually done deals with local government as well. So uh, they've agreed to some flexibility in the work uh, arrangements so that people can be tasked to maybe do different jobs to what they would normally do. Uh, so there's been a lot of uh, uh, give and take uh, from workforce as well, but certainly different states have, uh, have taken a different um, response uh, to this. Uh, and, uh, and you, know, but, you know, going back to the, you know, sort of the base of a lot of this is that states uh, are the, the con you know, the, the constitutionally controlling body of local government and, uh, you know, there's been a couple of very uh, high-profile court cases over the, you know, the last decade mm -hmm. around the federal government giving money directly to, to, uh, to local government in some ways. Um, uh, some of the things that we do do probably don't completely stand up to a constitutional lawyer, you know, uh, roads to recovery, uh, some of the, uh, the drought uh, funds that have gone directly into councils, bridges for renewals, Heavy vehicle safety. Oh, that's it. Heavy vehicle safety probably has a state government uh, kind of connection, so it gets it. But so there is there is that open ended uh, constitutional issue between the federal government and uh, and local government. But having said that, uh, it's the it's the body that we go to is uh, in times of crisis. Uh, the local government. I I'm a great believer that they are the ones on the ground and mm. they're in the the best position to um, deliver. Uh, that 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 stimulus and that support. That's why we've given local government uh, the the money for stimulus in drought areas and uh, and and also in bushfire areas. Just very quickly, in passing, the issue of uh, constitutional recognition of local government at the Commonwealth level was a very live issue a few years back. Now, sort of seems mm -hmm. to have dropped off the radar because of other things, obviously. But is that an, an issue that you're keen to see resolved in any way during your tenure? <laughs> Yeah, look, it's a it's a vexed issue because, uh, you know, as a supporter of local government and from local government, I actually can never quite see what the issue is with some of the opponents. And uh, I was on a committee that was set up, I think, from memory, Julia Gillard was the Prime Minister at the time, and we uh, we uh, we uh, were on a bipartisan committee that uh, had had some hearings around the country on constitutional recognition. There has been discussion uh, in this term of Parliament, obviously, with uh, the issue around the recognition of Indigenous people in the Constitution and maybe tying that in with a referendum on local government. My feeling is on both cases, unless it is portrayed in a way that's going to actually be successful, it's best off left alone because if it's defeated, then it's, it's, it's another 20 or 30 years before it can come up. Uh, and, if, if, and, if, and if the Indigenous uh, issue is defeated, then the the issues, the social issues um, in Australia, uh, I think would be very negative, devastating, even in some some communities. And so, uh, uh, to be honest, I haven't put my thoughts to that issue uh, while we're in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, but I suspect um, we our community mightn't uh, be focused uh, enough by the time we need to do this in this term of government. So. Yeah. This is just my personal feeling. I think maybe it's probably going to be get kicked in down the road a bit longer now. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. And it is it is high risk given our um, history of uh, 
pretty much almost never delivering a yes yeah. vote on referendums. Um, Minister, before you go, regional communication health uh, parts of your portfolio. I don't think we've got enough time to talk about regional health issues no. today. But just yeah. on regional communications, I assume you're keeping a close eye on this exponential growth in video conferencing that's happening during COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. And the digital connectivity outside the metropolitan areas, what's your read on how the system is holding up to the demand at the moment? Um, to be honest, better than I thought. I thought uh, we were actually going to get swamped by very irate people. And I'm not saying we haven't got irate people with issues, but I'm speaking to you now through the Skymaster satellite. Uh, I'm on a, on a small farm next to a town of a thousand people in northern New South Wales. And I've been running uh, my office uh, as minister for those three portfolios here for six weeks. I've only, left, I've only left it a couple of times, quite frankly. I went to Canberra for the sitting week. I drove down 10, week, 10 hours each way. Uh, right. But uh, uh, the only time it slipped me down is that I was going to do a lot across the sky. And a, the only thunderstorm in the last five years happened to park on top of the house at the wrong time. <laughs> So, so Skymaster, uh, and, and there's been so there's been extra data allowed uh, by NBN uh, to Skymaster users, uh, more flexibility. Uh, I think with telehealth uh, now with education, we've got some education uh, um, uh, products uh, because they can now uh, divide up. Don't I don't want to get too technical because I don't understand completely, but they can divide up the different tasks uh, that the Skymaster satellite can deliver. So uh, education now is going sort of as an unmetered service. Uh, to the to the consumer, I think there's an arrangement with state governments on that. We're doing deals with the flying doctor on telehealth, and I think with the advent of telehealth now during the crisis, that's going to become more of a role. Where we are having trouble is that some of the telcos who don't have a satellite product have been selling a lot of data services on the phone network, and uh, that's what's really struggling. So the NBN in town, where it's direct wireless, whether it's copper or fibre, seems to be holding up. I think the wireless, uh, direct wireless, I think not hearing too much in that space uh, where, where people are getting into trouble. And a lot of the people think that is the NBN is when they get a product from Telstra or Optus right. that says uh, this, and it's actually the phone service. And mm -hmm. so we, we really need to get more people uh, putting their data uh, through the NBN, uh, whether it's satellite uh, uh, or, or, or direct um, in town, uh, mm -hmm. so that we can free up the phone service so that when people are... Uh, in a mobile location, they can use their iPads or phones to move data. So that's where people have been frustrated, uh, is, yeah. uh, is, is that network hasn't kept up. That's interesting and, and not as bad as some um, might have feared. I, I was interviewing the CEO of Infrastructure Victoria on this program a few days ago and talked about that body and Infrastructure New South Wales, as I understand it, uh, their stated uh, position that digital connectivity for regional areas should be a higher priority even than high-speed rail link, for example. Is that, mm. a, is that a position that you agree with? Yeah, I do. It's, you know, it's become more and more important. And my, my, you know, in my electorate, I've got multi-million dollar businesses that might employ 50 people that are 200 kilometres from the nearest centre. So uh, uh, with, we've just announced round five uh, of the mobile phone and black spot, I think 182 towers. But, there's actually an underspend in there uh, because mm. the telcos have actually dug their toes in and said, oh, we don't even care with the subsidy. We're not going to go further into that area. So a couple of the, uh, the sites in round five uh, were to a, another, uh, a newer player who is looking at delivering uh, high capacity broadband and phone services in partnership with Optus into regional areas. Uh, and uh, so we've got around 5A and there's a discussion paper out now and your members might be interested to look at this. So we're looking at three things uh, in 5A. Uh, that is uh, uh, innovative models to deliver uh, uh, data and voice uh, in, 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 in hard to reach areas. Uh, we're looking at a more resilient mobile um, network in bushfire prone areas because that was a huge problem. Uh, in the fires, and we're also looking at missing links of coverage along major highways. And uh, you know what's been clearly shown up in the fires that that is that the reason the phone network went out more often than not was because the electricity connection burnt out on right. the yeah. on, to the tower. Mm -hmm. And so I've met I've been meeting with some you know uh, some of the uh, uh, companies who believe that they can put in a permanent freestanding power source solar slash battery. Uh, in a remote location so that those uh, 
those uh, uh, space stations are much more resilient uh, in, a, in a time of fire or flood or whatever. So that's uh, 5A. Round 6 uh, uh, is budgeted for, and what we learn out of Round 5A will determine uh, how we go in, uh, in Round 6. And I think we'll see a big change to what we've seen in the past because we do need to get into those uh, tighter uh, to reach areas. And we're starting to see private providers now uh, delivering high capacity broadband uh, around rural districts from the top of grain silos and, uh, and, and other things to, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, it's more expensive, but some of those rural businesses are prepared to pay more uh, for the better service. Minister, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. It's been terrific to speak with you. We've covered a lot of ground. We could have covered a lot more, I get a sense. And one thing you've done for me is make me realise that there are different levels of self-isolation in this country. You being right out in the middle of <laughs> um, farming land is, is, was an amazing picture that you've painted. Uh, really appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, look, I, I, I'm looking forward to going back to work normally, but my wife and I are still good friends. And, uh, uh, and, it, it, and I don't end up uh, each day with about a five hour drive somewhere. So it's, uh, it's been a change, but uh, looking forward to getting back to, uh, to civilization. All the very best and thanks for being so generous with your time. Good to speak. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. We've been speaking with the Federal Minister for Local Government, also Regional Health and Regional Communications, Mark Colton, on this special edition of VLGA Connect. Hope you enjoyed that discussion. I certainly did. If you'd like to make some suggestions for future topics for VLGA Connect, we always welcome your thoughts. Send us an email, vlga at vlga.org.au. See you next time on VLGA Connect.